In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. It reads, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. God is with us. I am so glad. Someone say so glad. Ah, oh, turn to that neighbor that didn't say nothing. Say, aren't you glad? <laughs> I am so glad that we serve a God who's not only real, who is not only the creator of the universe, but is a God who is with us. He hasn't removed himself. He just isn't, and it'd be so easy for God just to sit back, you know, set things in motion. And sit back and say, I wonder how this is going to work. Or look at your life and say, well, that's a train wreck. In fact, that's a dumpster fire on a train wreck. I don't know if that's ever going to work out. And then just sit back and watch things. But no, God is not just a God who is over, but he is a God that's interactive. He's a God that's dwelling with you. He is a God that has chosen to not only... Uh, in, in, in partake and in, in interject in this walk that we have with him, but he intervenes. He's with us. God's with you. Hmm. You know, we, one of the things that we did when, especially when the uh, grandkids were small and they were all here, we'd have them up uh, to, the, uh, to the house and all our grandkids were there on Christmas and what we do before any presents were open, we would have a um, little nativity scene. I, I like this one here. It's, it's made out of porcelain, and that's it's really it's one of those things you don't even want to touch because, you know, it'll break type of thing. But we had the, we had the plastic one, you know, the, the little plastic, um, uh, precious moments, plastic nativity scene. And so what we did is we give each kid a piece and, they were, and I read the Christmas story, and then they acted it out as I read, you know. So they got to be participation in the Christmas story. And, uh, and so, you know, and they were talking about Mary and Joseph, they were on the way to Bethlehem. So Mary and Joseph, and they had a donkey with them, and they were, you know, they were walking down the mantle, you know, all the way to the, where we had that little major set up. And then, the, and then the shepherds came, and so the shepherds, they had a couple other, they were shepherds, and they, and their sheep, and they're walking along to get to the manger scene. You, you, you understand that? And then the angels appeared, you know, oh, and, and that was happening there. And they all get to the manger, and then, and then we're wondering, what happened to baby Jesus? It was one of my younger granddaughters who was in charge of baby Jesus, but in, in, the, in the process of everything that was going on, we lost baby Jesus. And then the other kids were starting to get a little bit upset because you can't have Christmas without Jesus. It is his birthday, by the way. <laughs> and incidentally, we're going to have church in his house on his birthday. <laughs> I don't know where you're spending his birthday. It is his birthday. <laughs> Some of you looking at me like, I said, it's his birthday. <laughs> okay. So we went on a search. The search party was sent out to find baby Jesus. And he was found. And so the story was complete. It was said in the manger. And everything was good. And so, you know, we have, we have this ideal in this picture, if you would. Here is the, the old picturesque, and this is a lot of times we see this in, in different types of videos or different types of uh, nativity scenes of uh, you know, kind of a feeding trough, and that's what the manger was, is it's a trough for feeding. But, you know, in, in Bethlehem, and in that surrounding area, 
it was most likely a large stone that was hollowed out and was used for feeding the animals. Jesus was set in a feeding trough, which was also doubled for the place of slaughter where they could lay that animal in and slaughter that animal and it was placed in that position where they could not only dispatch but they could take care of cut up the animal wasn't that interesting that Jesus was set in a place as a baby knowing that he was a lamb that was set apart for sacrifice so much meaning to that so much insight and if you would really want to glean the background of the prophecies that were fulfilled and why he fulfilled them and why he set those things in motion because he is still setting things in motion he is still fulfilling prophecies prophecies that he spoke and he will fulfill all the prophecies there's prophecies yet to be fulfilled How many are looking forward to the the next one, which he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you will be also. Amen. That prophecy is going to come to pass. And so this babe in a manger, this one that was set apart, and as Matthew proclaimed, he is Emmanuel, God with us. Question is, do you know this Jesus? Do you know him? Uh, not just about him, because you can know about There are people that will study. They will try to define him, to understand who this historic person was. And there are a lot of people that spend a lot of time, in, in, even in religious circles, trying to know him by studying him and looking at the Word and all the different writings about Christ. But it's not about Christ that you need to know so much as you need to know him personally. Not only about him. And it's good to study the word and know who he is, his personage, as well as his deity. But to know him personally. To have a relationship. Someone say relationship. We see in... Philippians chapter 3. If you would turn Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Here's Paul that is saying that I might know him. I want to know him. You see, Paul spent the majority of his life in knowing about who God is. Knowing about God's Word. He had memorized the Word. Understood the Word. But now he's saying, I want to know Him. Not just about him. I want to know him. And I want to know him in a profound way. I want to know him in the depths of relationship of who my God is. I might try to understand these things. And I will be able to glean some more knowledge and insight if I know him. So he says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. And oftentimes, we have this desire to experience the authority of the power of God. That resurrection power. And I'm looking forward to the resurrection power. That He breathes life into dead things. That provision and that authority that is yet to come. He said, I want to know Him in the resurrection power. And, someone say and, the fellowship of his sufferings 
to be conformed to his death. And he goes on, and this is the reason why he wants to know, not only in the power of resurrection, but the fellowship of the suffering being conformed to his death, if by any means that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's what's coming. When the resurrection power, the resurrection power that brings the dead back to life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, I want you to hang on to this. This is the promise. This is an absolute promise of God. If you believe that there is a God, you believe that there is a provision to forgive you of sin, if you believe that He has given you life and life more abundantly, that He has separated you, then you have to also believe in the resurrection of the dead. You also have to believe there is life after this life. This life comes to an end, but the real life, and how many of you, the older that you get, your reality becomes more of the life to come. You are closer to heaven than you are to this earth. Spiritually, you have come to life and you know there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than what we're going through now. As if, if this is all there is, I've been ripped off. But there is so much more. Someone say more. There is so much more. I like this portion. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And I, I like the way that, that Paul inserts that and gives us this insight is that we've, we've got to have that assurance and that's the blessed hope that Paul calls. He, it's a blessed assurance that we have eternal life. Now, a, a dear sister, Sister Shirley, went on to be with the Lord. That was her time. God called her home. The word says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Joy, this is what I know more than anything about your mama. If she didn't make it, we all in trouble. <laughs> that sister made it. She was looking forward to it. <clears throat> and, and talking with her there in the hospital, in the ICU. She had such a peace about everything that was going on. There wasn't any anxiety, any worry. In her eyes, she knew that God had it. And that same comfort and that same provision, that same joy that she's experiencing now, it's my prayer that that, that would be extended to her family, that you would experience the same joy to the grandchildren, to the great-grandchildren, to the, the in-laws, and even the outlaws. <laughs> that God would just extend that provision and peace to this family. I know that she was the matriarch, and I know that many of you are serving Jesus because of her testimony, because of her prayer, because she said, this is what you're going to do. Didn't give you any choice. But that legacy did not end when she entered into heaven. That legacy rests upon each one of you. And that, those anointings and the giftings that God had given to her is extended to you, Joy, and to this family, rest upon you. And that blessed hope, I'm pretty sure it's sooner than later. I'm, I'm thinking that this in days that we're living in, that this rapture of the church is going to take place a lot quicker than some of you believe, that some of you even know. I believe that God is going to come for his bride, and he's coming soon. If you believe that, say amen. If you know that you have hidden your life in him, 
And you have that same blessed assurance that we are going to be reunited with our loved ones that have gone on before us. You see, when my grandma left and she went home, she was the most powerful matriarch that rescued our entire family. Hadn't been for Lillian McManus, I would not be serving Jesus. I'd be dead or in jail. I know that beyond a doubt. She stood in the gap and made a difference. And so that rests upon me to continue that same legacy and that same provision that my children and my grandchildren see Jesus when he comes for them. How many with me say, we've got to get ready and we've got to make sure that our hearts and our lives are ready for this blessed hope. Because that trump of God could sound in the next few moments. That shout of the archangel could cut loose and it's going to be loud enough to wake the dead. And the dead in Christ are going to come out of the ground. Ah, what a glorious day. I'm looking forward to that moment. Jesus caused us to be ready. That's the resurrection power to bringing dead things back to life. And it's not just the physical. It's not just the physical things. I want you to know that Jesus and that resurrection power also will bring back a dream. God gave you a dream. He gave you a vision. He gave you a purpose. He gave you a heart. He gave you a passion. You know that God wants to do something through you. You know that God is going to fulfill those dreams. He's going to fulfill those visions. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. You might have thought it's gone. You might have thought it was buried. It's too late. It's too far gone. But God still resurrects dead things. He still brings back relationships. He still brings back anointings and giftings. God still rescues those who are perishing. Even though that they've turned their back, God will still rescue those things that are dead. Someone say amen. See, the things you thought were gone, the things that you thought it was dead, it's buried too late. I know that Jesus will bring back your passions. He'll bring back your desires, godly desires, not only for revival, for an open heaven, for the quickening power to bring back to life the things that you thought. Ah, some of you used to burn with passion. Some of you used to burn with anointings and gifts. Some of you had such great desire to see an open heaven, to see God do it. It's not that those things are gone. It's that the the passion has just kind of died down and it's just a, a glowing ember It used to be a a bonfire, used to be a blaze, but God's going to resurrect those same passions, those same desires, and you're going to see. I said, you're going to see that open heaven. You're going to see God fulfill his promise. Now, that's the resurrection power. Paul said, I want to know him, the resurrection power. And you can know that resurrection power. And that's why he's with us. You see, discouragement will come. And you'll be disappointed. And you'll be let down. You say, well, I don't, I don't see that in, in godly people. Uh, really? <laughs> There's some that mask it a little better than others. How about the guy that called fire down from heaven? Elijah, he was pretty passionate about revival taking place. He wanted to see Israel fall on their face and turn back to God. But in his way was a guy called King Ahab and his wife, Jezebel. And they were bent on worshiping Satan. We had 300 prophets just alone that were worshipped at a, an idol, a deity of man called Baal. And the nation had turned away from God. And, and Elijah's whole passion was, and he was preaching to repent and turn back. And he wanted to see Israel restored in so many ways. And God put it within his heart. And he had a showdown. Do you like showdowns? Okay, Corral was nothing in compared to this one. He shows up and the prophets of Baal were there. And he lets them go first. He said, whoever God answers by fire, that will be our God. That was the deal. You remember, that was the deal. Whoever answers by fire, then the nation, that will be our God. The prophets of Baal, they 
did their dance and their chants and their yelling and their screaming and their cutting themselves and, and nothing. Not even a little wisp of smoke. And after that nonsense went on for a few hours and nothing was going on, Elijah prays one prayer, making sure that they knew exactly this was God. He took gallons and gallons of water and he doused and he saturated and he wet down that sacrifice, that wood, and so it was wet, wet, and where the water literally was puddled up and pooled around the bottom of the altar, he prayed one prayer, the heavens opened up and fire fell. And not only consumed the sacrifice, consumed the wood, and even burned up the very rocks of the very altar that was built, and lapped up the water that was around, and it was nothing but a dry, burn-up hole in the ground when God got done to prove and to show His people that there is still a God. Now, Elijah prayed and fire fell. But the hearts would not turn back to God. Elijah did not see the result that he thought was going to happen. Didn't do what God thought was going to do. Surely the people would turn back after seeing God move. And after all these false prophets destroyed, surely the nation would fall on their face and begin to worship Yahweh. But no, they did not. In fact, the bitterness and the hatred of that queen would turn on Elijah, and he ended up running for his life and found himself in a cave. And immediately after that, he began to have a pity party. I know none of you have ever had a pity party. So it's hard for you to understand what it's like. But you can see Elijah in this dark cave, and he's kind of complaining. He said, I'm the only guy left. Might as well just kill me. God reminded him, no, you're not the only one left. I still have hundreds that have not bowed down to this idol. And you've got to remember, Elijah, I'm still God. And finally shook him out of his darkness and reminded him of his anointing. And he went out and continued to do what God called him to do. And God raised up another to come alongside and to work with him for a season. That's how Elisha started his ministry alongside of Elijah. And this is what I know. There's times that you might feel all alone, but God is still God because he's with you. You might be faced with adversity and you don't know how you're going to get through this thing that's faced you. But you got to always come back to the knowledge and to the promise. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm with you always. You're never alone because there always will be your God, your Savior. From the very beginning, when he came 2,000 years ago, he said, I am with you. I will be with you. That's the power of his presence. That's the anointing of his presence. In John 1, verse 14, he said, And the word became flesh, and the flesh dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. And the glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus dwelling among us. He's with us. I said he's with us. Working for a rancher. <clears throat> and uh, he had just planted a, a field of alfalfa that he had prepared. And springtime had come and it was coming up pretty good. Looking good. He had a next door neighbor, and sometimes neighbors are kind of ornery, and this next door neighbor had some hungry cows. And so the fence was conveniently let down, and wires were cut. And the rancher looked out, driving, driving out, looking across his ranch, and then he seen that the neighbor's cows were in his field. 
eating that brand new alfalfa that was just trying to make it. And he knew if he didn't do something that that whole entire field, that 40 acres would be lost. And so he, he runs the, the cattle back out and he, he comes and fixes the fence and, and uh, calls me. And we, we, put the, we put a fifth wire up and, and fix that fence. And he calls his neighbor and says, you know, your, your cows kind of broke through there and what's going on. And Man, I don't know, you know, cows are cows. They don't know which side's what. And they've just seen that nice, beautiful hay, that nice, yummy, fresh, brand new baby alfalfa. And so we fix the fence. And well, a week goes by, and that fence is down again. Those cows are right back in the same field. And just uh, this time, they, we didn't catch it in time, and it was about done. And so he, we go fix the fence again. He goes, um, and there was a couple guys that used to help us doing when we were moving heavy equipment or we're building something. And, and there was two big guys. They're big. I mean, not just big, big guys. There was John. We called him Bubba. He went about 6'4", 350 about then. He was in his 20s, a big guy. And another friend of mine, his name was Mike. Mike was about 6'2", and Mike was chiseled, and he always cut the sleeves off of his shirt because he couldn't fit his arm in a regular sleeve. He was that big, you know, big guy. So, and he was just, just a, a mountain of a man, both of these guys. And they used to run together. They worked in the oil patch, and he said, well, I want you to go get John, I want you to go get Bubba and Mike. And I said, okay. So we went and got them to it, and he said, why? He said, well, I'm going to take them. I'm gonna, I didn't tell them thank you enough for the last job. They helped us. I'm going to take them to lunch. Go tell them I'm going to take them to lunch. So I went and, ran, went and rounded them up, and I'm coming out to the ranch again. And, and, uh, and so he, the, the boss man, he jumps in, and we all go, and we go over to the neighbor's house. We roll up. And he says, he says to them, guys, I just want you to sit here, and when, when I, get it, I get it to the porch, I want you all to get out of the truck and stand in front of the truck. Don't want you to do anything else. I have to say anything, just do that. Okay? Okay. So Bubba, Mike, and we don't, you know, I don't know what's going on. We all stand in there. I kind of had an idea, but they did, had no clue. They're just standing there. And, and he talks to the other, the neighbor, the other neighbor rancher a little bit, and that's it. We all get back, get in the truck. Bubba goes, what was that all about? He said, well, that was about negotiation of territory. <laughs> you know, that fence never got broke again. <laughs> I don't know what he said or, what he, or how he said it, but it was enough to make him understand whatever the reason, because there were people that were with us. It wasn't just some scrawny kid that I was, but there was some other, there was some backup. Somebody say amen. You know what backup means? When you're going through it, you're not alone. You have backup. And it's not just a couple knuckle draggers like Mike and John, Mike and Bubba. You have the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. He said, I am with you always. And when you got big brother with you, ain't nobody going to mess with you. Someone say amen. He said he dwells among us. He dwells among us. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I am with you always. And when God's with us. Now, it's, it's more important to know the why. Someone say why. I'm glad you asked because you asked. Now I can tell you why. See how that works. I'm going to give you a few things. We're going to jot these down and just let God connect. Because I know some of you are going through it. I know some of you are dealing with a couple of things. And, and so as you hear the encouragement of the reason, the why behind it, Jesus knew what was going to happen in your life. He knew the days that you're going to be here. You know, the very breath, every time that you breathe, he knows how many times you're going to breathe. He knows the hair on your head. He knows all your days. He knows your footsteps, you're coming and you're going. He knows your beginning, and he knows when you're going to enter into eternal life. He knows all those things about you, so he knows the struggle. He knows the battles. And that's why he said, I'm with you. 
and the why. Number one, to sustain you. He will sustain you. What does that mean? To keep you going. When you have no more go and you just want to be done, he comes alongside and says, let's go some more. Let's keep going. He'll pick up the weight and sometimes he'll pick you up. How many of you have just felt a supernatural strength that you did not have? And you said, man, I don't, I don't really want to do this anymore. But God comes alongside and says, I will give you the ability to do what you cannot do to keep you going. Number two, to empower you. Now, this is something that all of us need in this hour. It's the ability to do what we cannot do. When we cannot, he empowers us and gives us the authority. Someone say authority. That word authority is given to you. That is the power. That is the provision. That is a stamp, if you would. And he said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If two of you agree upon touching anything in my name, I will do it. Ask, and you will receive. Ask in my name. That is the authority. His, his name, his profile, his, his anointing, some would say anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit that's given to us by Jesus gives us that ability to do what you can't do. When you can speak to the mountain and say, be removed, it has nothing to do with your own ability. It has nothing to do with your own insight. It has everything to do with the word that God is giving to you and the authority behind the word, that anointed word that is coming out of your mouth when you're speaking into that darkness, when you're speaking into those situations, circumstance, and God gives you that authority is to empower you. He's with us. To heal us. And healing is, is so much more than just your body. I am so thankful for the healing that has come into my body. I'm so thankful for the, the brokenness that sustained and God has just injected that healing that has flowed. But it's so much more than this physical. That healing comes to the soul. Someone say soul. What is your mind and your emotions? Sometimes my emotions need healing. I'm an emotional wreck. I'm talking about me. Some of you are looking at it and say, he's talking about me again. No, I'm trying not to. Now, emotions are, and there, I've heard somebody a number of times, folks have said, I wish I just didn't have these feelings. You know, feelings, N nothing more than feelings. Was, you know, I don't want to be in this emotional roller coaster up and down and up and down. I was, just wish I just wouldn't feel anything. No, you don't. God gave you those feelings. God gave you those feelings, and, and, and yeah, there are times there's sorrow, and I understand sorrow, understand those, those times of hurt when you, when you go through situations, circumstances that bring. But what's on the other end of the spectrum of sorrow? It's great joy. It's, ladies, it's like when you're pregnant with that child. And you know, I've, I, I know I don't have a clue, and so I'm not even going to try to go there. And I, I know that some of you ladies say, well, you get a little hangnail and you think it's a problem. You've never had to deliver a kid. Well, that's true. There's that. And so I know, but this is what I've seen because I've been there when my children were delivered. My children and, and my, my lovely bride, she... she uh, She's pregnant, and that's no picnic. I understand that, carrying that child for you know, nine months, and some of you a little bit longer. And it's just like, what's with that? And, and then the pain in childbirth is overwhelming. But how many of you remember this? After that doctor, that midwife hands you that child, 
and all the pain is gone. Isn't that amazing? So when you're going through stuff, all you need is just a baby. No? No. What I'm saying is, is that, yeah, you'll, you'll go through difficulties. You'll go through sorrow. You'll go through pain. But God will give you great joy. He can turn it in just a moment. He can bring things into your life that causes you to fulfill in the happiness, the satisfaction, the peace. You see... He wants you to dwell in those places and of being happy and full of joy. Joy unspeakable. And so he'll bring healing into those areas. Healing into your mind. Sometimes my mind is overwhelmed. Sometimes my mind is, is just not thinking clearly or straight because of circumstances. And he'll bring healing into my mind. Bring healing into my spirit. The fourth thing is to embolden. He does that by increasing your faith. He'll increase your faith and give you the boldness that you need to minister and to be the blessing and to be the lighthouse. I was talking to a number of people today, and do you know this is during this season, during this time, with joy has come to the world. There are so many people that are struggling with depression. And I think it's why, uh, because when there are those that surround the family and there's happiness, they see people that are happy, they see people that are full of joy, and they themselves do not have it. They themselves are struggling, and so that compounds the matter and moves them into depression. You know, you can be the lighthouse during this time of year. Be aware of your surroundings and your circumstances. There's a lot of times that people will respond to you kind of with ugliness and hatred and bitterness. And it's because of what they're dealing with inside. And so it's important, and it's hard. It's hard when they're being that way. They're being, they're being a snot. They're not being real happy. Like and you're thinking, well... You know, every, every Christmas has a Grinch. I guess the world nominated you. But you, you be aware of what's going on so you can look past those things and begin to minister to them. And immediately, and, and it's, it's difficult at times because this morning, you know, I'm, I'm driving through the place to get coffee and I'm... And, uh, and before I have my coffee in the morning, I'm, I might not be Mr. Happy. And it's early, you know, and the, the sun's not up yet. And, and so I'm getting coffee. And, and, uh, and the person, the person behind the counter, yeah, I can, because they work there, they're probably working on their third or fourth cappuccino. And they're not only wired, they're like stupid happy. How you doing? You know, I'm barely alive. Could I have my coffee, please? You know, and I'm not feeling it, but there, and and so and so I get it. And some people are are just they're they're just bouncing along, and and if you're not feeling it, you, and, and so understand that is your joy, and your happiness might not be received. Understand what's behind that. Don't be like the like the the one that just gives back and just bounces off and, and you react to it, but respond and be a shock absorber and, and give back to them a blessing. Give back to them that encouragement as the Holy Spirit leads you. Find out what's driving them. Find out what's the weight. Find out what they're dealing with. Be a lighthouse. Let God bring healing through you. Amen. You have the answer. Come on, you have the you have the provision, you have the grace, you have the joy. 
Let God give you the boldness to be able to bless them and encourage them. Give you the insight. Give you the increase to minister to them. The fifth thing is that he gives to us because he's with us. He gives us guidance and direction. He guides and directs us. Not only to show you the where, but the how. He'll give you specifics on what he has for you. What he wants for you. How he's going to minister through you. Specific places. Specific people. And in this season, it's so important to be led of the Holy Spirit. That we're able to minister and to touch lives. To give to them the real joy of the world. The Lord has come. And the last thing is to fulfill you. He wants to fulfill you. He's with you to fulfill you so you can walk in your purpose and fulfill your destiny. Someone right now might be saying, well, Pastor, I'm not sure what my purpose is. How do I find my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? Something that just connected and, and, uh, and, and give me some great insight to help get you started to understand what God has for you in the fulfillment. I want you to look at all the gifts and the talents that God has given to you. What are you talented with? What are you good at? What do you do that it just comes easy? Look at those talents that God has given to you. You know, your talents and your gifts define your purpose. Do you know that? God give you those things because you're going to need those gifts to do what he's called you to do. Some of you never know a stranger. You can walk up to anybody and everybody, not only strike up a conversation with them and have interaction, but you, they walk away from that, that interaction. They walk away from that connection and they feel blessed. And your happiness just washes over them. Some of y'all have that, and that is a gift. You know that? Not everybody has that. Not everybody has. Some of y'all don't know a stranger, and some of you, that's a stretch, and that's okay. That's your gifts. Some of you are awesome in connecting with children. You can, and you're like a, a kid magnet. Kids love you. Nod your head, yes. Some of you, kids are terrified of you. Each of you have different gifts and talents. That kind of defines and directs you of what your purpose is. And once you begin to see that, see, this is where God has led me, and this is how I can minister. This is where I can connect. This is where God will use me. And he's with you right now to fulfill your purpose and that you'd walk in your destiny. Could you stand... This morning, stand with me if you would. God is with you. Uh, touch that person next to you and tell them God is with you. God's with you. God's with you. Some of you just said, this sure is a touchy-feely church. Amen. <laughs> Hugging on people, shaking hands. There is there's, uh, there's a great provision that God has given to us today to remind us when, as he came, he was laid in a manger from the very in sight of the promise of the prophecy, he came for that purpose, to be with us. And he's with you. He's with you right now. He's walking with you. He has surrounded you with his provision, his protection, his great grace. He's given you the strength when you didn't have strength. He's healed your body. He's got underneath the weight and he's carried you. 
And this is a wonderful time of the year to be thankful and to remember what he's done for us. Father, again, I thank you for the greatest gift I have ever received that anyone. Lord, I thank you that that gift of your life, not only to give me eternal life, but Lord, to walk with me, to give me the strength that I need, to give me the help every day, not just on the weekends, but every day that you're with me. Lord, you have sustained me. You have comforted me. You have carried me through some of the greatest, most difficult seasons of my life. And you've given me joy. You've given me a peace. So, Lord, I ask that we that have received so much not only be thankful, but Father, help us to share that love, that provision with those of our family, our friends, co-workers, our neighbors, even complete strangers that you would put us in contact with. Lord, help us. In this season, Lord, it is truly a time of joy, a time of celebration. Help us, Lord, to be the encouragement. Help us, Lord, in, in the next couple of weeks. Keep that focus. Minister to these now. Lord, I thank you that you have walked with them and you have given to them the help that they needed. Jesus, you bless them coming in. I'm asking that you would bless them as they go out. Bless them in home. Bless them in the city. I ask, Lord, that you'd go before them and prepare their pathway. Lord, I'm asking that health and healing would rest upon them. Sickness, disease would not come near them, nor nigh their dwelling place. And I'm asking that be extended to their children and their children's children. Lord, I'm also asking that you would open up the heavens and provide for them for all of their needs, according to your riches and glory, according to your word that you said give, and it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm also, Lord, guide and direct them. Open up doors that need to be opened, closed doors that need to be closed. And give them your presence like never before. Walk with them. Remind them, Lord, you're with them always to the very end. In Jesus' name I pray. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Give him praise one more time. <clears throat> okay, our prayer staff is available.